a Ween podcast with Shane and Rory. Hey, what's up? This is Shane. And this is Rory. And this is Weencast. And we welcome you to a new episode. Yes, welcome everybody. Good evening. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, we've got an awesome episode coming at you tonight. You read that correctly. We got Claude Coleman. That's right. The Claude Coleman, drummer of Ween, on for you tonight. Yeah. We're really excited about it. Had a great conversation. But we're going to get to that in a moment. We want to first remind you of our amazing Weencast Summer Spectacular Fan Story Contest. Uh, that's a mouthful, but uh, if you haven't seen our ad yet, we just want to take a minute and explain uh, what this uh, fan story contest is all about. Yeah, man. So basically, we want your fan stories. We want you to record an audio clip for us in either a wave or an MP3 format of any Ween story that you would like to share. Could be something that happened to you at a concert, could be something about listening to one of the albums, anything that has to do with you and Ween, we want the story. Everyone seems to have a crazy story about how they first got introduced to Ween. So, you know, that's fair game. You know, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah. You know, we already, we've already gotten a little bit of chatter on uh, Instagram and Facebook uh, about some ideas that people have. I hope that they follow through and send them in to us. But yeah, so the whole idea here is that we're just trying to have some extra fun. It's the summertime. There's a pandemic. You know, sadly, it's we're still mostly stuck at home. So let's have some fun. Let's have a contest. You know, everything's better with a contest. Um, as Shane said, you know, we, uh, you're going to do an auto recording of yourself um, and then send us the wave or the MP3. Uh, you can email those to weencastpodcast at gmail.com. And the deadline for all this is Labor Day, September 7th. So please get this in, get it into us by uh, Labor Day, okay? And anything, anything that you record, please make it five minutes or less. Yes, good call, good call. You know, and, and something else that I just wanted to share. So some people may have uh, anxiety or just not, aren't, aren't, maybe not sure about, you know, how to go about doing this without uh, buying a microphone or uh, downloading some new program and then learning how to use the program. So I want to tell you that this is way easy. So all you got to do is use your phone, all right? Whether you have, <laughs> what, whether you have an Android or an iPhone, uh, you should have an audio recording app already on your phone. So you would just go through all your different pages of apps and find one that says something like audio record or a microphone record or something like that. And if you don't find one, you can download those for free. Just go to your regular app store, take you five seconds, and it's simple. Yeah. Just hit the record button and talk into your phone and it will record you. And then when it's done, it should be a file on your phone that you just got to email to us. You know, I think I would also accept if someone just makes a, a video of themselves that I could just take the audio off of. If someone wants to just... Now, I know that everyone is able to do that, at least, on their phone. And I'll worry about that, that the tech part of it. Send, send, us a, send us a video of yourself talking, and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. I'll make it work. Yes, and, and also um, another avenue is every text messaging um, service on a phone has an audio recording function. That Good you call. Can, that you can use to talk to people instead of texting. And, uh, and so you can also do it that way. The key is you just got to send us the file. Uh, once yeah. you get the file recorded, uh, if you're having any problems getting it to us, just email us, check in and we'll figure out, figure it all out. So totally, um, you know, one last thing. So I realized I forgot to talk about the prize. Um, yeah. It's not just so, a contest in name. There is an actual prize involved for the best story deemed by us, by the way, we're going to pick yes. the best story. So the finalists are all going to be played on an episode of ours, probably in late September, uh, shortly after the deadline. So we're going to play all the finalists for you on, on the air. And then the winner is actually going to win a beautiful, handcrafted, boognish emblazoned cutting board. Uh, this is a handcrafted cutting board made uh, by a small woodwork company, West Brandywine Woodworks. It's a little bit outside of Philadelphia. Uh, they, may, they do really great work. Uh, they make the cutting boards. They do wood art art for uh, wall hangings. Uh, they repurpose uh, bookshelves. They redo old bookshelves, uh, uh, picnic tables, anything made out of wood. These, these guys uh, rework and redo and make beautiful. So, so it's a really a beautiful prize. We're getting some pictures put up uh, shortly on the, on the uh, socials. 
But uh, but yeah, dude, totally. it's absolutely a beautiful prize. Um, you know, I'm gonna I, I'm not 100 sure right at the moment, but I'm gonna say that this item probably is gonna retail for uh, 25 to 35 dollars. So this is a nice cutting board, and uh, and you're gonna love it. So anyway. That's what the winner Sounds is. great. And it's going to have a beautiful Bugnish, Bugnish burned on there. So it's going to be really cool. Right on. But uh, yeah, so I think that about covers it for the contest. So get the get your stories into us. We'd love to hear them. We can't wait to share them. Now, before we get to the interview, before we get to Claude, uh, we also want to welcome a special guest tonight. So we're happy to welcome Tomato to the show. Tomato is back. Yes. So Tomato's got new Sound of Virgin music coming down the pipeline. So he kind of checked in with us and uh, asked if we could uh, chat with him about it to spread the word. And we, of course, agreed because we love chatting with Tomato and, and we thought that would be an awesome time. So, um, so yeah, Tomato's got this new Sound of Virgin prescription plan. He's got new music coming at us for these crazy pandemic times. He's going to tell you all about it. He's going to tell you all about it in just a minute. Uh, we are on the phone with Chris. Tomato 11, we welcome you back, Chris. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. We really want to talk to you about the Sound of Urchin prescription plan for 2020. Can you tell us how, <laughs> how this idea came about? You know, 2020 was going to be our year to sort of get back into the game again and come back out. And we have about 50 songs recorded, uh, <laughs> 50 new songs. So we asked uh, the fan base on Facebook what what they thought and if they would dig a subscription service. And you know the the people that we that we care about said yeah sure I'm in and that was all we wanted to hear because we just want to focus on the people that we can, that you know that really dig it that that really want the music. So we essentially came up with a plan where uh, for for the next five months August through December the last five months of uh, 2020, on the first of the month, you'll get a new EP of five new songs or six new songs. And then on the 15th of the month, you'll get uh, a, a, you'll get an archive, something from the archives and something from Bill's vault, the ill vault, uh, which is like, nice. live, <laughs> a, 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 he has every, he has every live urchin show on, uh, on that tape, you know. Oh my God. Every nice. single one. That's awesome. <laughs> So he dug in, uh, and he dug into uh, to his ball. And so on the 15th, uh, he's got this show from Cookville, Tennessee that we did where we open up with the Price is Right theme. And then we just go into like this. We, this is like 2008, and we just go and and just slam it home for like the next, like whatever, hour and a half, two hours. And he's like, that's going to be the first one. And the next one maybe will be uh, – some cover song, like uh, you know, choice covers that we've done live, and um, that's great, man. So that's the idea, and and the first EP we just um, sort of unleashed on August first, and it's called Moonlight Over Hell, mm-hmm. and it's six songs, and the, the actual uh, like the app or the interface that you do, it's an email that you get, but it's really really simple to use. Because you can either stream the songs from your phone or laptop. You can either download MP3s or waves, lossless waves. It's just like one click. Here's the music, and you know, very easy for people to use. So that's that's the reason why we went with that that kind of interface. I, I downloaded the first one, the first EP, um, the other day, and I have to say it was super easy. Uh, the one question I had is, you know, this is starting in August and going to the end of the year. So if someone was to sign up, you know, a couple of months from now, so if someone doesn't sign up until like October, would they get everything from August until then? Yeah, yeah, you, everything. Um, and, you know, that's great. Definitely. We need to spread the word about that. But if anybody signs up from now through December, uh, they'll get all of the emails and all the material uh, in, in the email, you know, just like a, a backlog of emails. That's like the way that it should be. Like anybody that wants the stuff can can get it, even if they get onto it late, for sure. So what's the best way for people to get hold of you then in terms of signing up? Oh, yeah. Uh, so just sounddiversion.com at our website. There's two ways. You can either subscribe monthly, and it's 12 bucks a month, uh, you know, for the five months, and, and and you get charged every month like a subscription, 
Um, or it's a fifty dollar like one time one time deal, so you save a couple of bucks, and you know essentially that works out to ten bucks a month. But uh, you know you it, you're gonna be uh, you're gonna have a lot of urchin listening uh, during those five months. <laughs> you know we have endless endless cool shit shit we did with Mickey. Uh, you know all this random stuff that that we're just gonna throw at everybody. So uh, you know that's, yeah, that's great. Well, that's cool, man. I mean, I think it's it's. You know, it's a testament to you, and you know you can you can tell that you're one of those guys who is always up to something. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's so it's so much fun just to like follow you on Facebook and like you know see the 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 new you know the new songs that like you're working on and stuff. So like this is just like a you know an urchin fan's dream come true. It's just like yes, like you know it's exactly what I would want. You know, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome, man. Ever, Every once in a while, it's new urchin songs. It's like sweet, you know. <laughs> yeah, and like it, 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 it's you know, it's also not going to be on Spotify. It's not going to be on YouTube. You know, maybe one song, uh, you know, with the teaser songs or whatever. Um, but otherwise, this this is like this isn't for you know. This is just for people that want to hear it, really. You know, right? And uh, we've had some great uh, great amount of signups in in the first you know the first couple of weeks and that's been really cool and 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 we definitely want more people to hear the music so sign up people go to sounddiversion.com and and support us but you will not be disappointed with the amount of music we're going to subject you to (laughs) so that's cool man Thank you so much, Tomato. Everyone go to soundofurchin.com to sign up for the prescription plan. You get new urchin tracks for the whole rest of the year, which I think we can all use right now. Am I right, people? Hello, all you ween heads and ween cast listeners. This is Travis from West Brandywine Woodworks in Chester County, Pennsylvania. At West Brandywine Woodworks, we specialize in items for the home like cutting boards, serving trays, shelving, and pretty much anything else you can think of. We are very excited to be a part of the first ever WeanCast Summer Spectacular Ween Fan Story Contest, where you, the listener, have the opportunity to tell your craziest, gnarliest, or brownest ween-related stories to the guys at WeanCast for a chance to win a limited edition, handmade, Boognish-branded cutting board made by yours truly. So what are you waiting for? Record your story and submit it already before it's too late. And don't forget to give West Brandywine Woodworks a like and a follow on Instagram and Facebook. Boognish lives! And now, let's get on to the Claude interview. So basically, we really wanted to talk to Claude about what he's been working on over the last few years, which is Sound Space in Asheville, North Carolina. It's soundspaceavl.com or at facebook.com forward slash soundspace at rabbits. Claude was so nice to talk to us, and he just tells the most brilliant tale about moving down to Asheville and really makes the town and scene and everything down there sound so great. Sounds like a, just a brilliant town for me music and art, culture, and independent business, which Claude is now a pillar of the community with Sound Space at Rabbits, and he just tells the most fascinating tale of starting this business. We were just so thrilled to be able to talk with him. You will be able to hear part two on our Patreon. Sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash weancast podcast and you'll be able to hear the second part of the Claude interview which is a little bit more about Amandla some of his own music playing with Ween and also with Angelo Moore of Fishbone in the meantime let's go to part one so let's go to the call thank you so much again Claude for a brilliant conversation okay so we are on the phone with the legendary drummer, man, to make a legend, Claude Coleman. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Claude. Um, this is a real honor, and we're both very humbled, and we really appreciate it, man, really. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, amidst such as myself, is happy to appear in this lesson. <laughs> Demystify the myths and, uh, you know, just nullify the legendary status and just kind of bring it down to earth and i'm happy to talk with you guys and anybody else for that matter you know i'm happy to happy to wrap thanks man. that's what we're here for bring it back, bring it down to earth and um and i just want to say thank you as well i really appreciate you taking the time absolutely very well well why don't we why don't we sort of start it at 
how you got to uh, how you got to move down south because I think everyone sort of thinks about you as being sort of you know one of the New York New Jersey guys. So what what took you from you know the Northeast to to the south? Uh, well, first let me ask: Can you can we allow uh, profanity? <laughs> oh, of course, yes. dude. Okay. Yes, perfect. I, I I didn't ask that before we started. Just wanted to clear that. Uh, it's fucking fine, dude. It's fucking fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's a sort of a personal story. Uh, how I ended up uh, down here in this area. Um, but I have a saying though. You know, you can take the boy out of Jersey, but hey, fuck you. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, uh, I, I can identify with most places around the country. Like, I haven't been traveled around the country for so long, like, you know, a couple of decades or so. But, like, you know, I always retain my jerseyness and retain my New Yorkness and my New York phone number. Uh, so, um, you know, it hasn't been too hard a transition. But uh, how I ended up down here was, uh, I mean, the short of it is uh, having lived in Jersey my whole life and, um, just kind of being tethered to that area with so much going on. Uh, specifically, I was married, uh, and uh, my marriage came to an end, a uh, 16-year marriage. And when that had happened, it kind of uh, made me untethered. And um, New York, New Jersey is a grind and a hustle, unlike any other place in, in the world. I mean, you're paying top dollar. You're paying $100 to step out of your house. New York City or something, you know, uh, New Jersey, your taxes are 30 thousand a year, and just litigious and just, you know, fines and, 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 and costs that, you know, people, you know, they just like gasp when they hear how much it costs to live in that area, even though the income kind of supports it. But, right. when I, yeah, so when I had that option to kind of like, you know, think about not living in that area anymore, um, I kind of, you know, jumped on the chance. Like, you know, yeah, let me, you know, with everything kind of had, had coming to an end, let me consider living somewhere else. Um, we tour like a lot around the country, and for so many years, like, you really, you often, you know, get experience in these different environments, these social environments, and these towns and cities and these neighborhoods where that just has other quality of life that's, you know, the fantasy coming from Jersey. And, in New York, where you just have a lot more leisure time and uh, <laughs> a lot more <laughs> vacation time and just a lot of stress, a lot less about the grind. So I was like, yeah, let me consider moving out. You know, it'd be a good time. and Maybe this would be great for me creatively and professionally and stuff. And I kind of made a short list of places in my mind. Um, I was considering California for a minute, um, which is kind of like the West Coast, New Jersey, in terms of expenses. Uh, yeah. And, it really is. It's very expensive, and it's kind of like politically strange or something. And then uh, I was considering Texas for a while, which I spent some time out there to kind of get a feel for it. when I was uh, finishing my last record, uh, Laughing Hearts. Um, I went to live with a good friend of ours, uh, Stephen Haas, and this child with his family, and stayed out there for over a year or so to kind of like get a feel for the Austin area. Um, and then I quickly decided that that wasn't going to be the, the place where I settled, even though I love that area and I love uh, the energy that it is. Uh, it's uh, it's too hot, it's a little too deserty <laughs> or something, and Texans are just Texans, which is, you know, both good and bad. <laughs> so uh, I <laughs> kind of, like, went down the short list. These other places, Nashville was, was you know, number three or four. Uh, you know, we have been going to Asheville for like 20 years or so, we used to always go to the city before there was even much of anything there. It was a college stop and they had a single venue. It was called Be Here Now on Broadway downtown. And certain parts of Asheville, which today are like just, you know, gentrified, like you wouldn't even believe. They're kind of like Williamsburg, Brooklyn or something. But there are just parts of Asheville that were just like third world countries, man. Even downtown, it was just like, well, from kind of just, you know, Southern and, and kind of just like you know, this 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 habitat for just weirdos, <laughs> just weird creatives and bees and just like artists, you know, just kind of doing a thing. So I always had a connection to Asheville for as long as we've been touring through Asheville. Nice. You know, for, yeah, for a long time we've seen the development and the changes, and we played at some of the first venues like Lawrence Peel had opened up, and it was just amazing to see the transformation. 
And then, like, over the years, I had friends kind of defect out of Yankee territory down to Asheville from New York and then New Jersey. Like, you know, that, they would say, you know, I'm out of here. And they'd go down and tell me about how great the quality of life was and, and what a great, kind of amazing, uh, you know, a creatively sort of energetic area it was and stuff. So I was on my shore list, and um, I went into the town, the city of Asheville, on my way back from Texas. Uh, to, and then I did the same thing with Asheville. I kind of gave it like a two, three week sort of trial run. I actually subletted the apartment of Eric Slick drummer, Eric Slick. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And <laughs> so then Eric's day. <laughs> he was very kind to do that. And I actually used it <laughs> to kind of finish some mixing on my record. But yeah. Dr. Dog was sort of, uh, my little bit of an aim into the area. Although I had a lot of friends around there. So after I stayed in his place for like three weeks or so, I was just like, this is absolutely fantastic. You know, it's such a foodie scene. It's, it's, it's just so creative, so affordable. The, the mountains are incredible. You know, everything in Ladder was just, just amazing, amazing, amazing. And then I just made the decision right then and there to move. And then, you know, kept New Jersey. And I went to my storage space in Jersey and just came back down, brought it all back down here. And ever since I arrived here, from day one, it's just been like everything's just fallen into this really amazing place and this really amazing support. And uh, I've just had, this, uh, yeah, man, I've had this really amazing level of, of, of life that, you know, was a bit difficult to achieve up in Jersey. So, you know, I feel like I made a great, great choice. And I'm digging my heels in deeper here with the business. And uh, you know, my girlfriend and I are raising a child here and bought some more properties down by the river. So, yeah, I have no plans on leaving any kind of awesome. you know? Yeah. I've moved around a lot myself, and so I've lived in, you know, little villages, big cities, uh, and, and things in between. So I kind of get a, a sense of what you're, what's going on with you. Uh, I was wondering if you could share, you know, what strikes you as some of the big differences, you know, when you go in between New York and Asheville. I know you kind of touched on some of them. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, you're, you're not, you don't, you're not pressured to work as much. So your leisure lifestyle is, like more expanded somehow. There's more fun things to do and be done, and um, and you also have more time to be creative. Um, that's a big, big thing. I mean, in, in the city, you just have to hustle to kind of keep yourself there. It's kind of the only thing you're really doing ultimately. And you know, when you think about it, depending on your work or your employment, you know, which you know, I'm a musician, you know, so it's you know sporadic and up and down. It's, Mm-hmm. Um, unpre- unpredictable so coming to an area like that like here which just allows you uh, just like way more freedom to just like relax and it's got to take a lot of stress off you it, and then yeah and so then what comes with that is the byproduct of that is like this just offload of just all this like burdens like stressed and it's, it's kind of amazing man it's like you're shedding uh, a suit of armor or something you know um, it really feels like that um, that's cool and uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, and then you know people are a bit more open, you know, uh, and, and you know the pace is slower, obviously. Um, and another huge difference uh, with Asheville and a lot of other places is that it really kind of incentivizes you to create and, and incentivizes people to create businesses and just like kind of like go for the dreams a lot more than I've seen. Like there's a lot of really amazing resources here for you to kind of take your, you know, your products or your idea or your services and like, you know, acquire loans and like acquire assistance and technical assistance with that and, and marketing with that. I mean, it, it really is amazing. Like a lot of grants and stuff. Um, and so because of that, I mean, Astral is like predominantly really like, you know, uh, original artists and original shop owners. There's like one section out of Asheville, out of downtown where they put all the box chains chains and there's only a few of them, but they're there. But they're they're out of town. They don't really have anything to do with the city so much. You know, you have to go there, you'll go there when you need to, but you know, the most of the main heart of the city is like just people doing original stuff and and the yeah, like city small independent businesses and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's really kind of awesome and perfect for you. Um, and I can't imagine, like, you know, starting what we started here, trying to do that in, in Jersey or New York. I mean, I, I can't even think of it. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's more possible yeah, describing it. Like opportunities are just kind of more, um, more like within grasp almost. Like if you if you if you do the work, you know you can attain it. it seems much more manageable in a way. Absolutely, and you can get better support. You can get a better chance to kind of make your dream work. You know, you really yeah. can. For us, it's so uh, it great. Let's talk about uh, these opportunities. So, so obviously, we're here to talk about SoundSpace, which is uh, your new uh, business venture, your new venture. So yeah, I, I want to dive in on that. And on the web, it says in bold, it says music rehearsal rooms, artist studios, cultural landmark. So first off, let, tell us about Sound Space. You know, like right. lay out so, for us, and we'll follow up. Right. So with everything amazing about Asheville and uh, the community in the city, it's an interesting uh, place because, and I think this is part of a strength, but it's a little bit like on the back end of like modern uh, American life in the sense that, like, a lot of, like, things don't yet kind of exist here with, that you're used to, and, and because I think everyone's, I don't know, needs and intentions are just that different. But, so what I mean by that is when we when I came to this area, I'm a drummer, I play with a lot of different projects, I produce stuff, um, I was playing a lot of groups in town, and doing all this work, and Asheville being like a totally predominantly arts and music-driven city, uh, it's like 45% of the product output of Asheville is the music industry and all the like peripheral sort of uh, industries that kind of surround that. It's basically uh, kind of sitting in the tourist sort of sector of stuff, but the music is like almost half of the product output, almost half of like the drive tourism here and it really is like that there's so much music there's so many bands there's so many venues uh they're on the street they're in the gas station they're in the post office it's just like everywhere uh but when i got here and i was trying to do work being a drummer uh i couldn't play in my place uh where i was living because i lived right. in close, close proximity to my neighbor who i love dearly we had a great relationship i cut her glass every week uh, she's a beautiful lady, lady and, uh, but she was from home and I just couldn't do any band practices. I couldn't really practice myself. And it was, and it's like that for like hundreds of musicians around here. There's no place to practice. And then for some reason, no one just kind of took it upon them to like create a practice space facility, which in like every city in America that has like a scene, uh, any kind of music scene, you know, it's like three to five of these types of places, you know, like everywhere. And they really, they do a lot to create like a, a music scene and create like a lot of kind of standout bands and kind of make a mark for themselves. So there's this whole, you know, culture and sort of process behind, behind it that they, uh, for some reason had been lacking. So I was working with this buddy of mine, doing some work in his studio in this crappy warehouse and we're up on the roof pissing into, into, uh, spackle buckets. And uh, I was like, man, this is th there's got to be a better way. All the music around here, why aren't cats like struggling? Like, you know, we move into like uh, we, I've rehearsed in Boy Scout lounges, churches, uh, storage facilities, just like straight up like cylinder box storage facilities, with, like corrugated metal doors, with, like power lines running down like to the end of like the block and shit. <laughs> and there's like eighty bands. There's like eighty bands in them. You're like, what in the hell is going on? Like, and then and then they go play in these gorgeous venues, like you know, gorgeous showcase venues with all this money. It's like, what? What? There's an imbalance here. So a friend and I kind of took it upon ourselves. We're like, okay, you know, we can do this. We should do this. Like, community needs it. This is an amazing resource. We get this open. We could just crush it, and uh, it's just so great for so many reasons. Totally self-purpose driven too, because like, man, I needed a space. Like, I still need a space right now, like to do to do drums. I'd love to do like all these streaming lessons, and I see all my buddies doing that. I just don't I have studios to choose from, and I'm at disposal. But like, you know, there's however much they are, you know, the books or whatever. It's you know, I don't really need like a recording studio to just kind of like mm -hmm. do a lot of. It lot of the stuff so you just need like a space literally a space to yeah, be in that you know you're space. not gonna bother anybody with a loud noise yeah i mean uh, a space uh, that's uh you know well found proofed and well decoupled and is built out that you know it's not gonna you know, be intrusive to anybody else mm -hmm. so we kind of came up with that idea like all right let's do this first space, first space so it took us like three years to find property in Asheville because like Asheville is super super tourist centric minded like it's 
called on tourism. It's like tourism, tourism, tourism. It's a, it's a tourist destination. And every other week, it's like, you know, uh, whatever. Number one, uh, you know, beer, beer capital. That's another thing too. Is they call it beer city. It's got like the highest amount of breweries per capita for size. It's just got all these like tourist sort of like attractions to it. And people that own property know that they're just like sitting on gold mines and stuff. So we would just find these properties. Like, you know, we want to do this type of space for the music community. This is a great resource that we might need. We're going to crush it. Oh, it sounds great. Oh, uh, no thanks. And, and so that happened like three or four times just over the course of a year and a half, finding a place that was owned by these folks that would like kind of string us along. And then at the last minute, just drop in like, ah, you know, second thought, the square footage is, you know, three times as much as we did. <laughs> and they would just kind of cut it off <laughs> over and over and over. And they would give it to a spa and they would give it to the third brewery location or they would give it to a chocolate factory or a cafe. Like it was just all these like tourist sort of central minded kind of businesses. Right. We're losing out, you know, we're losing them, losing out to. And then, so we found, uh, I just took it to the, to the spot and there was this old tourist court, like a motel in the back with a two story building in the front. Uh, and it's located downtown, right outside of downtown, across from Mission Hospital in Asheville, which is the largest employer of the city of Asheville. So it's right dead set in, uh, the, like medical corridor. Um, of Asheville, um, and she showed this property, and it's been on market since 2003. It caught fire, so it was a little bit bombed out, uh, and uh, it was all derelict and like ghetto and just all sorts of hellish shit laying around, you know, ski masks and syringes and shit. And uh, wow. she showed it to us, and, and walking through it, like you know, this is great. Like we kind of had this idea to maybe acquire like an old motel and use that for rehearsal spaces because that'd be functionally really awesome like to be able to drive up to uh, a room and just kind of load and unload and it's a motel and kind of funky and kitschy and stuff. So yeah, this is a really cool idea, but you know, we're not going to get this. We don't have a chance. We don't have a million dollars of capital like every one of these other medical uh, companies along this strip have. Right. And she, so she was like, you want, you know, Claude, you got to look up the history of this place place with a lot of history. There used to be a soul food kitchen in it. Uh, it's been open since 40s, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it relates to all this other history of Asheville, this uh, incredible, uh, forgotten and lost and removed history of, of the black community in Asheville that nobody knows about. You got to look this up. You got to check it out. And, and if you really, really like it, you know, you should write something to the owner. I was like, okay, sure. And so I went home that night and uh, just started looking up, you know, rabbit, it was the place is called Rabbit's Tourist Court. And so I found out it was Green Book listed. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Green Book. There was a movie that came out a couple of years ago, won an Oscar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can go ahead and kind of explain it, but I'm a little bit familiar. Yeah, the Green Book was a ledger that was produced every year of uh, black-owned businesses where blacks could know where to plan their trips because during segregation, right. by law, you had to stay in a black-owned business or a black-owned hotel and motel. Right, and black media. friendly, basically. Yeah, well, black-owned. <laughs> black or black right. friendly. I, 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 there may have been, I actually don't know if they were like non-black-owned Green Book. Uh, businesses, but uh, okay. could, they could have been, but I, I, I doubt it. I doubt right. it. Maybe in, in the north. But we were Green Book listed, and then it was owned by this one family, this single family of the birds. They opened it in 1948. Uh, it was, and since it was open in, during segregation period, like all of the history of uh, all of the black entertainers have passed the Astro, which there was just a stunning, stunning list of all these legendary people because Asheville has always been a tourist city like since the 30s it's always been this destination like this cosmopolitan destination for like you know the big bands like Ellington and Armstrong and Basie and and then uh, a lot of the entertainers made this a regular stop and so it was like a chilling circuit spot Mm -hmm. And and this motel catered to all these people like just down the line and so like I just like that night I was like up to like three or four in the morning just like down the rabbit hole pun, pun intended there. yeah literally right uh, uh, literally literally just down the freaking rabbit hole and just like oh my god like you know and then just the stories of the community that this business was a part of there were these like flourishing flourishing communities all over Asheville Asheville had like at, at a time like 13% black population like there's all these pictures 
of uh, just, you know, just gorgeous black families, just like everywhere, left and right, they owning like, you know, 1,500 businesses and uh, the center of downtown block off, off Biltmore block, they called it, uh, was like, it was just primarily black businesses, one of the largest black business areas in the South, it was a lot like Tulsa, which had the Black Wall Street, which you may or may not be familiar with the massacre there, and then one night they burned like 400 houses and things out and everything. But it had that going on. It was just this like city of black excellence. It was just intense. And and then there were all these uh, activists within these black activists from the city, and they, were, they had their markets and fairs and like all these like business opportunities and drive-ins and parlors and clubs, and venues, yada yada yada. So this place was you know kind of born and created from that era. And that night, I was just like, oh, fuck, and, like, this is absolutely intense. I mean, you know, we have to restore this and, like, you know, yeah. reconnect, reconnect our yeah. this history. Because no one knows anything about this history at all. Still, to this day, we explain what we're doing and, you know, the history of this place. And we're like, really? You know, I mean, like, there's these, up until the 70s, I mean, like, there's there, there were these circuits just in Asheville of all these black clubs, uh, of all these just badass musicians, like these all black bands. Like, there's one band called Outcast. I have a picture of them on our website. And, you know, they look like the Ozzy Brothers, and they were like the, the number one R&B band in uh, North Carolina in 1973. They got like leather vests on and SG guitars and, and, and basses, and they just look like they rule. And like, that's kind of what was going going on. And, and uh, this is all this really cool history that um, was erased. And the story behind that is like, they had a program in Asheville, it was called Urban Renewal, and they basically redlined all these neighborhoods and took the property and, or, uh, you know, just kind of like lowered the property value and forced them to, to relocate. So, right, so they forced out like almost, almost 2,000 residents, uh, and, and, and businesses, just kind of just decimated all these communities. It took everyone. It was, it was over a period of 30 years. It just went through community by community by community and just, like, removed everybody. So now yeah. in Asheville, there's, like, 70% of low-income housing are all black people, and they don't they don't own the land anymore. They're just people that live there that are looking at, you know, plots of land they used to live in or they grew up in for, like, two, three generations, and they're just claims, and, and they're resold. And other people were uh, incentivized to buy them and stuff that blacks couldn't, you know, couldn't apply for or qualify for. So it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, obviously that was happening in a lot of places, but I know in I lived in Philadelphia for a while, and in West Philly, yeah. uh, used to go Black Bottom, if you're familiar at all with West Philly, and then the urban renewal there was all the, the universities basically taking dispossessing thousands of people in a similar way. Uh, I wanted to just follow up. You know, it sounds like the mission you had uh, moving into this business kind of evolves and changes as you <laughs> learn more of the history. And I feel like that's such an empowering thing to, to get that from history. So I don't know if you want to speak speak to that a little bit about how the mission changed and that empowering sense of history. Because um, you laid it out, man. I mean, it's not so awesome how much yeah. uh, goes into what goes into it when people don't even realize it. Yeah. Right. I mean, so yeah, we started out, my buddy and I wanted to open up jam spaces, and then it just became this just multidimensional just cloud of just uh, purpose and meaning, and uh, with, with all the history and uh, just the importance of, of getting this history sort of retold and reconnecting. And I mean, really, it's an explanation of kind of how and why Asheville is is kind of great as it is, but um, it also explains why it's a bit kind of white as as it is, and why you know lots of folks come to Asheville, like you know, friends of mine or relatives are like, "This place is amazing." Where are the black people? Like, you can make a shirt like <laughs> with that question. I was like, "Where are the black people?" At? Like, I mean, like everybody asks. I mean, it's just like, "Where are they?" Like, what's what's going on? And and that's, and that's kind of the the reason why. But yeah, it came. It became this just complete other mission and I've just, you know, dived into it like just full time. I mean, it's, it became about the community, it became about uh, the city's history, it became about, you know, the future of the city. They're, they're really right. making this intense effort to diversify the city and 
you know, inclusiveness is, is all the buzz word and diversity and, and, and ownership and, and entrepreneurship is all the buzz word because there's this, this horrible, severe fucking um, inequities and disparities. You know, like in the county of Asheville, is Buncombe County, at like 1.7 businesses are black owned. Like, you know, it's like 500 or so out of like 6,000 or something, you know. So they, they know like there's serious diverse, diversity issues. And so now I'm doing, you, I'm sorry to cut you off. You, you going back yeah. and, and learning the history of the area, you, you've learned that that was not a mistake. That where are all the black people? You learned that that was, yeah. that was done on purpose. Well, absolutely. It was very purposefully done. It was it was institutionalized. It was, right. it, was, it, was it was a program, and in Asheville, it was particularly severe. And you know, uh, I think Rory, you were talking about what, the ha- what happened in Philly, but you're you're right. It happened in every city in America, like everywhere, mm-hmm. um, to different levels and degrees of extremism. And then, but in Asheville, I mean, there was like eight or nine really huge flourishing communities that they just went through every single one over a period of like 30 years. Like it just went on forever. So it's really pronounced and long the, the damage and the relocation and the, and the acquiring of, of these other people's lands. Yeah. I mean, like it's become something else and I'm happy to help uh, bring attention to, you know, the stories and the history mm-hmm. as well as try to, uh, you know, uh, reconnect people with history, but try to reclaim this for the future. I mean, it, I'm starting with the, the man in the mirror. So, you know, we got our piece of dirt, you know, we're going to create, a, we're going to redo a soap kitchen, recreate the soul food kitchen. We have a great chef, you know, we're going to give that, you know, that's another black business owner there. We have mm-hmm. a couple of lease rooms in the property. Those are going to go to people of color, and we're just going to create this cluster of black entrepreneurship and just try to start a trend, try to try to let it bleed to the rest of the town. And, you know, you know whatever the, those businesses will do, they'll provide for their, the people around, in and around them, and, and maybe they can have some more opportunities. I mean, we're planning on scaling up, so we'll just kind of scale up that kind of idea of creating opportunities a little bit more equally, you know, um, beautiful and better equity, you know? So yeah, I became more than not finding the place to like, you know, practice paradiddles and right. <laughs> get more, more about trying to just kind of balance, like, you know, the, 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 the society of, of Asheville out. <laughs> well, look, and, uh, look. Well, it's been crazy because, uh, yeah, I mean, like, in a, in a really odd, really peculiar, odd sense, I've been, I'm, I'm becoming like a poster child for exactly everything they're, they're trying to do and everything they're about. And, you know, before the pandemic and before the lockdowns and before the Black Lives Matters protests everywhere, even mm-hmm. then, there was like this really strong desire uh, and uh, incentive for like the city and, and, uh, and, and, and county government. Uh, to kind of push this this idea, but now it's like intensified, and so you know the city and county are really trying trying to put the money where the mouth is, and so you know like what we're doing and, and what we're about is just you know about to just you know get all of the support we could possibly want, which is amazing. <laughs> Really is. Well, I think to me that it makes you a great uh, almost spokesperson since you kind of have been getting working on on your business now and, and now with the whole the, the Black Lives Matter uh, and gaining traction on the civil unrest. Um, has that make, kind of increased the urgency as well in a way? Have that have you kind of personally sort of been channeling that as well? I think it's increase the urgency to rectify what's wrong and, and correct the imbalances and yeah. the inequities, really. I mean, because so, uh, a lot of the issues around, around um, just, you know, so- social standing and class are, you know, financial and um, and ownership-related and equity-related and uh, generational wealth-related you know, that, that's mm-hmm. the biggest thing ever. I mean, like, blacks don't have anything to pass on to every, anybody. Um, they can't, they can't lend. The, the lending sort of uh, principles don't, 
work for a, a lot of people in general, but especially for blacks and, and you know, where, where it's like credit focused or collateral focused or this and that. And, and so they're actually like really rewriting like all of those kind of ideas and those principles to, to try to balance it all out because they are starting to realize it's just unfair and some people can't get above, uh, you know, those, those problematic Issues that they they right. they, keep, they keep them from owning things and from creating businesses and this and that. So uh, that's kind of what's happening. They're, they're approaching it from uh, an ownership and equity and, uh, and hopefully an educational sort of thing too. So it's you know it's a lot of uh, a multi pronged kind of approach. I mean, it's just the beginning of it. I mean, honestly, they need like five to like ten years of like total political upheaval. To really kind of like get right you know, the, the the level playing field that you know, everybody really needs and wants. I mean, like as I, again as 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 great as Asheville in the area is. I mean, it's south and it's it's just deeply embedded in uh, right. you know, the supremacy, man. It's it's uh, you know the, all the monuments around town are of slave owners that were rich because they owned a certain amount of slaves. I was wealth and uh, left and right and all the place names and streets. I mean, they, that's kind of where it came from. And they're, you know, they're, they're starting to, they're starting to have a reckoning with it, you know, which is also kind of interesting and exciting too. They're like, you know, taking down the monuments and covering them all mm-hmm. up with <laughs> canvas and stuff, you know, much to the chagrin of a lot of folks, but a lot more folks are happier with the idea of just like moving on and like modernizing like the ideas like you know what the, what the city mm-hmm. should be well and also being honest with history too right I mean mm-hmm. you know, rose colored glasses it can deny a whole lot of terrible things for sure you know I mean like I don't you know t- speaking to that I mean like I don't know to me it's called losing the war it's like you know, you lost. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the way it goes. I'm not, you know, I don't know how many statues and monuments are created for, like, the losing teams of, like, the <laughs> Super Bowl or the NBA <laughs> Finals, but none that I know of offhand. None that I know of, man. None that I know of. Yeah. And, you know, there's... The Eagles won, and we got, we got a statue. That's all I know. Yeah. So... And, and there's been thousands and thousands of conflicts in the United States that, you know, like, you know, lots of grandpappies and grandmammies like died and, and so forth. The only reason that those monuments were standing, I mean, it was to represent, like, you know, the supremacy was to represent, like, you know, the better, you know, man and just like have it stand as long as they wanted it to stand. And it's just not, you know, the, our society now is just too pluralistic. Like, you know, it's just, it's just not representative anymore. It doesn't fit. And what it represents That's so true. Isn't, isn't, isn't anything that anybody gives a fuck about. So just get the fuck out of there, you know? <laughs> Fucking <care. laughs> Absolutely, man. Well put. That's that shit. <laughs> I mean, hey, man, I'm with you on that, for sure, without getting too, yeah. too political. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not going too deep into that shit. I don't mean, know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's um, let's talk about the property a little bit. I mean, you know, uh, obviously we've done a little bit of, of uh, preparation, getting ready to talk to you, and and kind of doing a little bit of the research, and you know, looking at um, the like before and after um, photos and videos on uh, on Facebook and stuff of the uh, of the property. I mean, you guys have really turned that place around. I mean. It looks absolutely beautiful in the um, in the pictures of you know what it looks like now. What was that like, and and how long did that take you guys to to rebuild that property? <laughs> I appreciate that because all we kind of see is what's in front and what needs to be done, and it's, <laughs> it's always really difficult to see what we did do and how far we came. And every once in a while, I'll check out an earlier picture. You know, it was kind of just a doubt, you know, nightmare kind of a a place but uh uh it took us about two years you know we bought the property um and uh we started with a building company which gave us a bunch of estimates and then then immediately overran all of those estimates by like 70 or 80 grand Um, so then we had to break ranks with them while our lenders in, suspended our loans, <laughs> and so until we could redo and rewrite our plan with another builder, so uh, we had to we sat for about a year. My partner and I uh, paying out of pocket mortgage of the place and all the expenses just to kind of hold on to it. 
which was really, really difficult writing. It was difficult, and uh, and that was also kind of during the time that we was, was, we were kind of taking a little bit, bit of a breather um, at different times. Um, so it was a bit of a you know slow strangulation, and then we quickly found a builder who came in and uh, was able to just kind of reassess everything and gave us this new workable estimate. Uh, this uh, builder called uh, W T A P S out of uh, Asheville. He stepped in. They stepped in and uh, redid our estimate. Brought it way, 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 way down. Our lenders re-released our funds, and then we got back to building. And then uh, about now, you know, we're about like a few weeks away from opening the door. The first few spaces, uh, and you know, yeah, it took us about almost two and a half plus years so the timing now is all sorts of fucked up <laughs> um we're pretty we're pretty we're pretty excited uh because you know we we're gonna have uh, a bunch of uh, we're gonna have four spaces one's gonna be a monthly lease like a lockout and then three are gonna be hourly daily uh but we're just gonna use them as spaces and just kind of cater directly to the community because we no longer have any kind of tourist sort of uh market or community coming through. And a lot of the venues in town were clamoring for this. Like we were as we were building, all of them were just hitting me up all the time. Like, when you guys gonna be open, are you open yet? Because all these bands I'm in and like, you know, the disco biscuits this place called Salvage Station and they'd call up and like, uh, so we need personal space uh from A to the uh, not even asking if there was one and and then all these club owners and venues would just have nothing that to speak for or answer them with kind of embarrassment um so they they need the space just as much as us but now that market has kind of disappeared so now we're just kind of catering to just kind of locals and um we're going to kind of focus on streaming and and that kind of thing and uh and got to try to implement this really crazy uh sanitation <laughs> protocol for the use of space yeah totally which I that's kind of what I wanted to uh, follow up with. It's just, you know, this delayed gratification, and then you have this uh, pandemic kind of throw in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the band is still there. Like, you know, a rehearsal space is like, you know, kind of like, uh, isn't the best example, but it's kind of like a gym. Like, if you're an athlete or, or something, you need to stay in shape in the off season. So while no one's really doing gigs, you know, they they need to practice. Like, I need to practice. You know, I need to be in shape to be gigging, whether there's gigs or not. And the kind of ones like that. And so, like, we're actually still getting hit up a lot for, like, you know, availability, people thinking we're open, and this, that, and that, which is really funny. Because we're, we're the only, like, thing that comes up when you search Asheville <laughs> in rehearsal space, even though we're not open. But uh, I think the demand is still probably just as strong. We just have to create uh, the, the spaces uh, in a way that's going to make it really, really safe. And obviously oh, so that, like, you know, people don't want to go in there because, I mean, I want to use these, so I'm not going to go in there. I have a seven-month-old. I'm not trying to go into a space that, like, you know, eight bands use that day and there's no, like, right. obvious, obvious, like, you know, protocol, sanitation, whatever, just something I, I know of right off the top that they're doing to, you know, to just kind of clean it and keep it clean. So, right. So it's added a new challenge, you know, like, uh, but, you know, we, we, I think we figured it out. We're doing that. Uh, so you got four spaces opening up in August and people can start reserving them now. I just want to be uh, clear on. Sure. Sure. Um, not just yet. I think at the end of this month, we're going to start pre-booking. Uh, we're going to set it, set it up on the site. So if you're, you're a band, you can, you you know your best nights are Tuesdays six to eight or something. You want to snag that you know you can snag that early. So when we actually do open doors, like we open the doors and we just kind of come in and start using the spaces. So in another few weeks, uh, well, I, well probably in the end of next week we'll set that up, and then in August we'll like uh, open up the doors for everyone to start using the spaces. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. So, what about the uh, soul food kitchen? What's the timeline on that? I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about that, the kitchen. Right. And that's going to work in with you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Uh, that's probably going to take us like another year to develop that about the same time this year, or uh, this, this time next year. Is, is kind of what we're hoping for, hopefully. But we already kind of moved toward that. We already have this chef, and he's just going to kind of bring his entire operation in there. It's not going to really be my or partner's restaurant 
that's like one business I will never, ever, ever <laughs> get myself into. I know that. So you're only going to be, you know. you're only tangentially involved in the restaurant then. You're just providing a space more or less for someone else to kind of take it on? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, technically we're just leasing and uh, our, our, chef, our chef will be our tenant. And cool. there'll be a lot of there'll be a lot of creative co- collaboration uh, because of the history of the place and the history of that soul food restaurant. It, was, it used to be really really popular. The food used to be really amazing. We have this jukebox, this all vinyl jukebox, which we salvaged like almost all of the records, like 140 something records of just wow. like Stacks and Motown and just all this great like R and B. So we want to kind of creatively collaborate with him on like you know what it, what it's going to be, and we want to have a little bit of a focus in in, in his dining space or where we might be on the history of the area and the neighborhood, this and that. But yeah, it's just going to be all his his uh, his space and his business. The chef's name is Tyrant Robinson. You can look him up. He's quite a character. He, he has this, uh, his thing is cooking with comedy. Been testing on a bunch of different cooking shows. <laughs> On television, and uh, he's he's uh, he's done pretty well. But he, he loves to cook. I mean, you know, you go to yeah, you, know, you check out his Instagram. It's all he's doing is putting plates of his food up every night, like two three times a day. So, uh, it, 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 are there, is there, as long as there's vegetarian options, I will come down and eat there. Please tell uh, me there'll be something vegetarian. Yeah, that's a good point. So we we said that to him earlier on. I mean, we we are in actual level course, so. You know, we gotta have some pretty uh, uh, broad range, range, um, you know, vegan, vegetarian options on the menu. So he's all with it. Yeah, he's all down with it. And it'll be late night. It should be a lot of fun because there's no, there's no place kind of like that in Asheville either. So it's gonna be a combination of, like things that don't even exist in that. So it's gonna be a great hang. It's gonna be a cool scene and. People aren't going to want to leave there, you know. You're just going to want to jam and eat, and then maybe jam some more or something. You mentioned on your the website that it's you know a recreated soul food kitchen. You talk about the history, uh, and you you mentioned uh, getting the jukebox and the records and everything. What else has gone into the planning of making sure that that it is being recreated? You know, how closely to historical kind of standards are you guys trying to to make this? Not not really trying to get it close to that. We're just trying to create a kitchen, a soul gotcha. food restaurant yeah mm-hmm. um and you know to add to, add to that we're, we're going to be doing like this huge mur- murals project through the buildings that's going to be kind of depicting all the history and the, the guests and everywhere uh, uh and then we're going to hopefully most likely get a designated city as a uh, city landmark it's just going to be really great awesome yeah it's like you know if you've ever seen uh you know, a post with a sign. It's like, you know. Yeah, totally. Probably you'll have a little post outside. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, but actually, you know, there's a bunch of amazing reasons to do that. I mean, obviously, uh, it, kind of, it brings to the uh, 50% uh, tax, property tax deferral, or something like that, which is kind of amazing. So that'll be, that'll be helpful for us to kind of maintain what we're doing there and uh, keep it going and keep it afloat. Sounds amazing, man. Yeah, it will be. It will be once, you know, we get over a few humps and uh, we're going to get it open and it'll be fabulous. Super well, fabulous. it sounds a lot, you know, it sounds like the pieces are falling into place and it's really close. So it's awesome to hopefully you feel a little bit more like the lights at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, it's a mix of, uh, you know, super excitement and, and dread. <laughs> There's a Donovan song that I always refer to, that I always reference. It's uh, First There Is a Mountain. I don't know if you know that tune. Yep, sure. First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain. Oh, yeah. Then there is. Yep. And I, I, I swear to God, I'm a huge Donovan fan. I used to listen to that song for a thousand years my whole life, and then I didn't understand even really what it meant. And then I saw him live. We were on the road, actually. Nikki was at that show, and we were watching him, and then he played that song and explained it. He's like, you know, it's a mountain, and sometimes you climb a mountain, and you get to the top, and you're like, oh, that mountain is difficult, and then it's just, you're at the base of another mountain, aren't you? You know, it's like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> really, man? That's, <laughs> that's some big shit. It's really it's kind of it's blowing your mind, man. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> a metaphor for life, isn't it? You know? Totally, man. And Mickey actually hated that gig. He 
can't do it. <laughs> He's like, God, it sucks. <laughs> did did Dominic follow it up with telling you about how he uh, influenced the Beatles? I know he loves to tell that story. <laughs> yeah, he was tells, I guess, all those stories and, uh, you know, how John Bonham and Jimmy Page played out of Dirty Dirty and all this other shit, you know. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I was kind of going on a random tangent about Bob Dylan, but I did a video on YouTube. I found that uh, it's like Donovan and Dylan like hanging out, you know. And Donovan's like, "Oh, I'll play this song for you. Check it out." And it's a nice tune. But it's short and repetitive. And then Dylan's like, "Well, here's a song I'm working on." And he plays "Love Minus Zero, which is just like a really cool song. And then it, I just felt like in this video, I'm just like, "Donovan, you just been blown away. Like you should just put the guitar down for a minute." <laughs> That's funny. I'm trying to think. I just saw this. Uh, uh, oh, the Rolling Thunder documentary. Oh, oh yeah, that's fantastic. Dude, what a wild time! Yeah, super wild, right? It's super amazing that all that like, was that Scorsese, I guess maybe. Who did that? I think he was behind that. Yeah, he did okay. that. Yeah, but this is it's just wild that he's still just like we're going to put this together and we're going to go on the road. You know? It's yeah, just, it, it happened. It was so like haphazard and like it, I mean it, the mu- the music and the gig. And just like amazing, but I don't know how everything else was. But there's this one that your story reminded me of this one scene that Joan Mitchell is like she comes to a show or something and she's traveling with them on a bus and she's playing um what what song off a of hit Hygieria? Uh, you just picked up the hitcher, uh, prisoner of the white line on the freeway. She's like playing it like an acoustic and with uh Dylan and uh, like. I don't know, was it Graham Parsons or someone else? But it was just like, oh my God. Like, I was just like looking at that, just playing it for the first time and just listening to the genius of it. Like, I love those moments when like they're playing songs for yeah. each other and, and they're just the most oh, genius, mind blowing, like, you know, compositions ever. But they're just like, oh, this is something I wrote, you know? <laughs> and then when they're sharing it, it's like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's and when like, Joe Bias for a little while there was just dressing up like Dylan and like pretending to be him, I like, uh, that, that yeah, you know that that I mean, that made me look at Joan Baez in a whole different light. Actually, I think I appreciate a lot appreciate it a lot more after watching that movie. Yeah, no doubt. She's, she's sort of like the female Dylan in a sense, like just this angst ridden. And <laughs> she's like you know constantly difficult with the interviewers, like kind of you know. But like she's a badass in her own right. Like and she's been through much hell. Like yeah, all those folks kind of have too. I uh, mean, appreciate her a lot more. I'm gonna get some, total. I'm gonna get some of her records, actually. Some more of them. Well, Colin, I have to say, um, you know, this, this has been awesome. And I think we can kind of, uh, you know, wrap things up. I really appreciate, you know, you taking this much time with us. I really enjoy talking about uh, sound space. And so, you know, I uh, wish you all the luck in the world with, with getting that finally going. And um, I go, I get to Asheville every now and again, and I absolutely plan on coming down and I'll have to rent some space and do some recording with that, that sound space. And hopefully the, the Soul Food Kitchen will be open by then. Yeah. Well, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. When the next time you come through, whenever you do come through, yeah, the kitchen will be open and we can have uh, some pork chops and uh, some uh, cold 45. And uh, we'll just have to do some vinyls. And uh, all the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was great. Uh, it was great to wrap with you guys. Yeah, Claude. Thank you so much for for everything. And you know, good good luck with the uh, with the sound space. I, you know, I I just feel like it's it's such a a noble project. And I mean, we just you know we applaud you for um, you know taking a, a piece of history and you know bringing it back to life and restoring it. it. It's so refreshing in today's you know sort of throwaway society of well tear it down and just build something you know twice its mm-hmm. size in its place. You know what I mean? So that's just so beautiful that you know you're doing something and you know saving a part of of the history of the of the area and the community. Really, man, beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. I, th- I think I'm probably just, you know, enough of a dumbass and crazy enough <laughs> to get myself involved in this. But, uh, it, you know, I, I do appreciate that. I think it, I think it's, you know, it means something. And I'm not afraid to do this kind of stuff, you know, for, for any reason. But uh, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely, uh, it feels good. So, you know, once we walk through the, the, the lake of diarrhea, poop, <laughs> we will get to the shores of flowers and, and, <laughs> and bouquets and so forth, and it'll be a beautiful thing. But um, yeah, I appreciate that. It, it has been a pretty intense journey 
but I, I think it's worth it. Too. I really do. Well put, man. Well put. Well, yeah. you, thank you so much for, for taking so much time. This has just been a real honor and a real treat for us, man. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you back sometime. Um, if you, <laughs> if you, if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind and, uh, you can talk about anything you want. Oh, maybe the next business venture, you know? <laughs> no. We'll be open up down states across the country. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure why not. But I'd love to, definitely would love to reconnect with you guys once we you know we're open or, uh, you know, once, uh, like I mentioned, get some music out. And, you know, it's fun to talk. I'll definitely do that. Yeah, totally. Sign me up. Thank you awesome, so much, Claude. We really appreciate everything. Was that great or what? We want to say thank you so much to Claude for taking so much time out of his night. There is more to this conversation. And for part two, please sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Weencast podcast. Claude talks a little bit more about Ween, Amandla, and playing with Angelo Moore. So please join us for that. Check out Claude at soundspaceavl.com and also Amandla at A-M-A-N-D-L-A-N-E-T dot net. Amandla net dot net. Don't forget about our summer contest. Please send us your ween stories to weencastpodcast at gmail.com. If you're hazy on how to do it, just hit us up and we'll help you out. Check us out on all the socials. And until next time, peace.